Hi, it's Numan. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the 2013 PAST TSA paper, showing you the most efficient route to the correct answer for each question. Okay, question one. Which of the following most closely expresses the main conclusion of the above argument? Main conclusion, the main idea that the passage is driving towards. This week, a controversial chef is urging the great British public to sample a fabulous new meat. But instead of a buying bonanza, the chef's comments have provoked outrage because the meat in question is horse. Even the staunchest meat eaters are up in arms. Says a rival chef, I would never eat horse meat and would never serve it to my customers. It's not part of our food culture. It's unthinkable. But aren't we being just the teeniest bit irrational? After all, in France and Belgium, two of our closest neighbours, there are whole shelves of horse meat alongside the beef and chicken. Here we eat lamb and pig, duck, even deer, ostrich and kangaroo. If we eat these, what is logically different about horse? Nothing. So the main conclusion seems to be that we are irrational about horse. There's no reason why we shouldn't be willing to eat horse, just like we're willing to eat other things in Britain. And it gives you a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, uh, our neighbours do it. And secondly, we eat lots of other things that are a bit bizarre. So let's look at the options. A, there's no logical difference between lamb or beef and horse. No, <laughs> it's not claiming that there's no logical difference between these meats. It's saying there's no logical difference between being willing to eat these meats. B, eating horse meat in Britain is unthinkable. No, it's telling that as contextual information, but it's saying it shouldn't be. C, the British should follow the example of France and Belgium. I think it's a bit too broad. It should follow the example of France and Belgium with regard to being willing to eat meat. D, the British response to eating horse meat is a little irrational. I think this is what it's driving towards. There's something irrational about our response. It doesn't actually go any further to say that we should eat horse meat, but it says that we should recognise that our response is irrational. E, meat eaters have no good reason for objecting to horse. It doesn't actually say that. There may be good reasons, um, but there's no better reasons uh, than you have for eating other common types of meat eaten within Great Britain. What is the minimum range in which the true temperature lies? Three thermometers are each accurate to within two degrees above or below the temperature they actually read. One reads seven, one reads nine, and one reads ten. Okay, so this makes a lot of sense. Each one is uh, accurate within two degrees, so seven is accurate within five to nine degrees, nine is accurate within eleven to seven degrees, and ten is accurate within twelve to eight degrees. So minimum of eight up to a maximum of nine. So the range is eight to nine degrees D. We can see that because let's say we wanted to 10 degrees, well that's not within the range of this one. And uh, let's say we wanted to seven degrees, well that's not within the range of this one. So it has to be eight to nine degrees. Which of the following identifies the flaw in the above argument? The most popular theory about the origin of the moon is that it was formed from debris breaking off the earth in a planetary collision 4.5 billion years ago. If this were true, the moon would be made of the same material as is found on Earth. Examination of moon's rocks show this to be the case, although there's little iron in moon rocks. However, this can be explained because, according to the theory, the material that formed the moon would have come from the Earth's crust, not its iron-rich core. Thus, we should accept the theory as true. Whoa! So the flaw here is saying that just because the theory could be true, that it is true. So one of the key flaws within the theory is the question of what it's made up of, and that it may not be made up of uh, the exact same things that you would expect it to be made up of. But there's an explanation for what it's made up of that's consistent with our original theory. Just because what we know about the theory is consistent doesn't mean that the theory is necessarily true. But let's have a look at the options. A, the popularity of a theory is not what determines its truth. It's not claiming that because it's popular, uh, it's true. B, evidence that is inconsistent with the theory proves that the theory is false. No, um, it's not claiming that. It actually recognises that. and That's why it comes to the belief that it's true, because it's consistent. C, the explanation offered in the passage is not consistent with the theory. Yes, it is consistent with the theory. D, evidence that confirms the theory's predictions does not prove the theory is true. Exactly. Just because the theory is consistent doesn't mean that the theory is uh, true. E, a theory that is not consistent with the facts should be rejected, not modified. Well, the theory hasn't been modified. Which of the following is best supported by the passage above? The International Code of Zoological Nomenclature states that the earliest recorded scientific name for an organism becomes the official name. This seems fair, but the system is flawed. Textbooks show the sequence of fossil ancestors of the modern horse as Pliohippus, Meriochippus, Mesohippus, and the first horse ancestor, Hyroscytherium. The last of these looks out of place. Hyroscytherium was once more sensibly called Eohippus. This descriptive name means dawn horse. The suffix hippus, horse, is consistent with others in the list. Eohippus also sounds pleasant. The name was changed once when it was discovered that a fossil fragment that had been named Hyroscytherium 
Sotherium was really from the same animal that had until then been called Eohippus. So we're saying essentially that uh, this system is flawed. So let's have a look at the options. A, common sense is not a major factor in scientific naming decisions. It's not saying that necessarily that there is a sense, and I think maybe we would call it common sense, that aligns with the way that it's using this system, but it's not the most ideal uh, result. B, a system of naming organisms based on the date the name was first registered is not the most appropriate. So there's a suggestion here uh, that perhaps there's a more appropriate method, but it doesn't actually say that there's a better method. It says the system is flawed, but to know that there's a better method, we need really an example of one. So I don't think it's B either. C, the rules of the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature do not always produce the most sensible name for animals. I think this makes sense. We've got an example of where it doesn't make the most sense in its outcome, but we don't necessarily know anything beyond that. D, the name of Hyceotherium should be changed back to Eohippus. It doesn't go so far to say that. There might be good reason that it should be kept as Eohippus rather than Hyrocetherium, especially as that it's now well known to be this name. E, the rules of the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature need to be changed to allow for common sense. Again, it doesn't provide a case for changing the rules, it's just for recognising that they are flawed in some cases. Which one of the following is an implicit assumption upon which the spokesperson's argument rests? I never thought prison in Yorkshire, prisoners made no attempt to escape using ladders placed against the outside windows by drug dealers and prostitutes supplying their trades. A prison officer spokesperson said that this was because the authorities had made prisons too comfortable and thus failed to deter criminals. A large number of released prisoners quickly reoffended and returned to prison where they had all the comforts of home, a television in each cell, breakfast in bed, a wage and cash bonuses for good behaviour. OK, let's have a look at the options. A. Prisoners would not reoffend if prisons were less comfortable. This looks like the right answer to me. In order to make this claim that the reoffending rates uh, are a result of the comfortability of the prisons, we really have to be assuming that the reoffending rates would be lower if the prisons were less comfortable. Let's have a look at the other options. B. Many criminals are habitual offenders. That's not an assumption. It states that quite clearly. C. Not all prisoners are interested in drugs or prostitutes. It's not assuming that, and it's not necessary at all to assume that for its argument to be true. This isn't really about the drug dealers or the prostitutes. It's about the opportunity to escape being available to them. D. The conditionals inside prisons are determined by the prison officers. Again, it's not saying this. A prison officer wouldn't be railing against the authorities if they were responsible for the conditions inside the prisons. E. Reoffending rates have recently risen. No, they don't necessarily have to have recently risen. Um, they could just be higher than we would expect them to be if the prisons were less comfortable. So the answer is A. In which year was Arthur born? On only 360 occasions during the 20th century, was it possible to write the date in the form using eight different digits? One example was 28th July 1956. Eleven of Arthur's birthdays have been such dates, though not his date of birth. And in 1974 and 1983, the two digits that not form part of the date made up his age at the time. In which year was Arthur born? OK, so we know that the year is going to begin with a 19, which means the month has to be before September because the month can't be anything October onwards, because then it'll begin with a 1, and it can't be September, because that would involve a 9. We know it begins with a 0, though, and it's going to be less than 8. We know also that in 1974 and 1983, we had uh, two of these such dates. So let's put 1983 and 1974 here. Notice that these are uh, 9 years apart. Let's look at all the numbers we have now, and which have been used up. We've used 0, 1... 3, 4, 7, 8, 9. So there's three digits we have left that can be used in these three spaces. Now, of course, it's going to begin with 2 because the day uh, of the month can begin with 5 or 6. So there's a choice now between 5 going here and 6 going here, or 6 going here and 5 going here. Let's try each. Let's say we have 25, 6. 506. In which case, which two digits were left out here? Well, the two digits that were left out were 3 and 8. And the two digits that were left out here were 4 and 7. And we can see that this is 9 years apart. So this works perfectly. What year was he born in now? Well, we know he was 38 in 1974, so we can find his date, year of birth by just minusing 38 from 1974. That's 1936. So the answer is D. Who qualifies for a bonus? In order to qualify for a bonus, employees must feed. 
certain criteria. Okay, and they performed as follows. So let's have a look at the criteria. So to get the £1,000 bonus, you need absences less than 5%. Production target exceeded by at least 10%, which rejects at less than 5% of output. And then for the £500 bonus, all of the requirements are lower for all of it. So we can just ignore this entirely. Uh, we just have to qualify for the lower bonus. So absence is less than 10%. Sure is an absence less than 10%. Yes. It has to be less than. So this is not less than. This is equal to 10%. Yes. 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 Overproduction target. So who has met their production target? All of them other than McKay. So McKay is not going to make it. James is not going to make it. And then rejects are less than 8% of output. So they've got to have product accepted greater than 92%, which these three have. So it's going to be Smith, Patel, and Oluolu. It's going to be D. Assuming that East means as near as it matters due East, which one of the following can be said with certainty? I stopped in a town called Akilawund to ask the way to Eskiburg. The only sense I could get from a local was as follows. Ackland is east of Benford, Esberg is north of Cranton, Duncton is south of Ackland, and Cranton is west of Duncton. Okay, so let's draw a little map. We've got Benford here, Ackland has to be to the east of it. Exburg is north of Cranton, so we've got Exburg, it's always going to be above Cranton. Duncton is south of Ackland, so Duncton has to be somewhere here, and Cranton is west of Duncton. So we can actually move Cranton now. We know that Cranton is west of Duncton, so it's somewhere around here maybe. And we know that Exburg is north of Cranton, so it could be here, but it could be actually quite different. So I am in Ackland, I'm here, and I want to go to Eskler, Exburg. Okay, so let's be more precise about where Exburg could be now. We know that Ackland has to be somewhere due east like this. With Duckton, it could be any, you know, there's anything on the longest line. And as long as Cranford is, you know, west of Duckton, that's fine. So we know it's probably somewhere uh, in line with B. And we know that Exburg, the one of interest, is above C. So it could be above B, but it could just be between B and C. And actually, it could be over here, or it could be over here, because we don't know precisely where C and B are. So assuming that East means as near as it matters due east, which one of the following can be said with certainty? A, I need to go due west. We don't know for certain that you need to go due west, because E could be down here. B, I need to go to the west, but it may be northwest or southwest. So I think this is the answer. It's somewhere to the west. C, I need to go northwest. We don't know that. It could be down here. D, I need to go to the north, but it may also be a bit west. No. Uh, we don't know that it could be north. It could just be north, uh, southwest. I need to go southwest. No, it could be northwest. So the answer is B. Which one of the following, if true, would most strengthen the above argument? The recent campaign to reduce the number of people who drive while over the legal alcohol limit was very successful, but reducing it further is going to be difficult without addressing one of the main problems. People in rural areas have no choice in the absence of public transport but to use their cars. People who live in towns and cities can use buses, trains or readily available taxis if they want to go out for a drink. Furthermore, they don't have to go far to find pubs and clubs. Unless the government wants the level of drink driving to increase, it needs to ensure that far more pubs and clubs are built in rural areas. Okay, so anything that indicates actually it's not that difficult to get home uh, sober, uh, having gone out drinking from rural areas, that perhaps rural areas don't contribute as a significant proportion towards the overall number of drink drivers, or that uh, perhaps there's other ways to deal with uh, rural areas drink driving, is going to weaken the argument. Uh, so in the case of strengthening, anything that is in the reverse of that. A, the legal alcohol limit for drivers is likely to be lowered in the near future. Yeah, so I think that would strengthen it. I think it's going to be even harder then to ensure the level of, of what is labelled as drink driving uh, decreases. B, the public have been made much more aware of the dangers of drink driving. No, that would suggest that it's going to decrease because people are more aware now. C, many pubs in rural areas are closing because of reduced numbers of customers. No, that would weaken the argument because it would suggest that actually if there's fewer rural area pubs, maybe you're less likely to go out to the pub. D, the population of rural areas is predicted to increase over the next 20 years. This would strongly strengthen the argument. It's going to make form a greater proportion of the overall uh, people who are drinking, and so might significantly increase the level of drink driving. E, the police concentrate their drink driving campaign in towns and cities. Uh, no, that would weaken the argument, because it would suggest that the campaign has been successful where it's been focused, and that perhaps it would be equally successful in rural areas if it were just focused on those. So the answer is D. 
Which one of the following is the best statement of the flaw in the above argument? Another pair of British media personalities have announced their separation. Both are well-paid personalities who profit enormously from the publicity they attract from their behaviour. Media personalities like them usually employ agents who can generate publicity, arrange well-paid personal appearances, and sell stories and photo shoots to glossy magazines. These agents probably generate more income for some media personalities than their original activity, such as singing. Therefore, it's clear that talent is no longer awarded. Whoa. Yeah, I, I think the key assumption here is that these personalities don't have any talent, and they're being rewarded unfairly. Uh, and two, that because these people are being rewarded unfairly, perhaps, that the case where people are talented, they're not being rewarded. But let's have a look. A, these personalities may not be talented. Know that with strength in the argument. B, many performers may be rewarded for their own original talent as well. Exactly. Just because these people are being rewarded, perhaps, when they're talentless, does not mean that talented people are not being rewarded. C, agents generate a large amount of income for their clients. Irrelevant. D, agents may be destroying talent by their actions. Strange and irrelevant. E, personalities do not have to choose to employ agents. Irrelevant again. So the answer is B. Which one of the following best expresses the main conclusion of the above argument? Films are expensive to produce and must take a significant amount of money at the box office to cover costs before any profit is made. Thus, filmmakers are primarily interested in making a film that will appeal to a large number of people and to make a lot of profit. This often leads to the production of superficial, violent films that attract a large audience. Therefore, the government should invest in the film industry. If it did that, filmmakers would not need to be motivated entirely by the aim for profit. So it's saying the government should invest in the film industry. That's the action it's calling for. And the reasons it gives for that are that simply that uh, filmmakers are being motivated by profit currently and it's leading to uh, less high quality outcomes in terms of the quality of the films that are being produced. Let's have a look at the options. A, the government should invest in the film industry. Exactly, that's the call for action we're looking for. B, filmmakers need to ensure their films will attract large audiences. No, that's one of the supporting premises that gets us to the conclusion. C, government investment in the film industry would reduce the need to aim for profit. No, that's the reason for the call of action. D, the output of the film industry contains too many violent films. No, this is a reason for the call of action. E, aiming solely for profit leads to production of superficial violent films. Again, a reason for the call of action. But the call of action is really clear and involves the word should. And that's the answer. How much will I have in total when my interest has been paid at the end of the second year? Answer the nearest £10. I've just joined a savings scheme. I will pay in £50 each month, and at the end of each complete year, I will be paid 5% interest on my average balance, i.e. the average of my starting and finishing amount for the previous 12 months. Let's look at the interest in year one and year two, and let's figure out how much the total interest is going to be. And then we can find out in total of our total amount. So at the beginning of year one, there's zero in the bank. At the end of year one, there's 50 times 12, there's 600 in the bank. We need 5 times 12 is 60, 50 times 12 is 600. Plus interest, which is the average of the two. Well, the average of these two is going to be 300, 600 plus zero divided by two. And 5% of 300, well, 5% of 100 is 5, 300 is going to be 15. So we have 615 at the end of year one. Okay, by the end of year two, we've added an additional 600 at the same rate of adding 50 pounds a month. And now we're at 1,215 as our total. Find now the interest in year two, we take the average uh, across the year, so 615 plus 1,215 divided by two, which is going to be 1,830 divided by two, which is 915. And 5% of that is going to be 5 over 100 times 915. Hmm. is going to be 4575 over 100, so it's going to be about 46 pounds. So we're going to add 46 pounds here, and we get 1, 2, 6, 1. So to the nearest 10 pounds, 1, 2, 6, 0. And the answer is B. What do our friends have to pay for one of Marilyn's cakes? Every Thursday, Marilyn spends 10 hours making 60 cakes to sell at her local market. The cost of ingredients to make each cake is £1.60, and Marilyn charges £6 an hour for her time. She usually sets the sale price for a cake at 75% more than the total cost of making it. However, when she sells to her friends, she gives them a 10% discount on the normal sale price. Okay, so we're going to find out the normal sale price to get the 10% discount. And to find the normal sales price, we need to find the total cost of making it. So what are the total costs of making it? We know that the cost per cupcake to make is £1.60. 16 times 6 is 96. So the total cost uh, of the ingredients for the cupcakes is £96. Plus £6 times 10, £6 pounds for her time. So the total cost for all the cupcakes is £1.56. And total cost per cupcake is 156 divided by 60. She charges 75% more than the total cost of making it. So she charges 7 over 8, 7 over 4. And we can make this 1, 
39. So it charges 7 times 39 over 60. And we'll leave it like that for now. Because then we know she takes a 10% discount for her friend, so that's 9 over 10. So it's 3 and this is 20. Okay, so that's as simple as it's going to get. So 39 times 21 over 200. 39 times 21. over 200. This is like saying £8.19 over 2 and then to divide that by 2 we just say that that's £4 and roughly 9 pence which is B. Which one of the following best describes the wages of the workers after the second change? A business facing turbulent times changed the wage of its workers by the same percentage in two successive years but the changes were in opposite directions. Okay, so let's imagine that you've got £100, you increase it by 10%, get to 110 and you decrease it by 10%, U minus 11, and so you end up with 99. And so you end up a little bit less than you started with. And that's because the 10% of the higher amount is larger than the 10% increase of the smaller amount that you started with. So you necessarily end up with something lower than the original wage. And the answer is C. Which one of the following inclusions is best supported by the passage above? Those who are in favour of coursework contributing to A-level grades say that this is much fairer than assessment by exam only, as it means that students who are willing to work hard to perform poorly in exams will have a better chance of doing well. However, this arrangement currently allows far more opportunity for cheating, casting doubts on its fairness. For example, there's a growing market for customised essays, available for a fee via the internet. At the moment, the only deterrent is a teacher's vigilance, but while teachers might identify work that seems atypical for individual students, they won't necessarily detect when, for example, a student has had an unacceptable amount of help from friends or family. So it's moving towards the conclusion that maybe coursework isn't fairer uh, than assessment by exams only. And that is A. Let's have a look at the other options. B, the opportunities for cheating in coursework mean that a level should be assessed by exams only. It doesn't go that far. It's only talking about fairness, first of all. There may be other considerations that's important. And secondly, it doesn't actually suggest that it will be less fair. It's just it may be less fair. See, traditional examinations are still the fairest way of grading A-level students. No, it doesn't tell us which is the fairest. It just tells us that there's fairness concerns with both ways. D, there is no entirely fair way of assessing students at A-level. No, it doesn't consider other methods which may be entirely fair. E, examinations do not assess how hard a student has worked. No, just because they're not able to assess it perfectly does not mean they assess it at all. The answer is A. Which of the following best expresses the underlying assumption of the above argument? largely because of the influence of celebrity TV chefs and increased customer demand. Many supermarkets have recently enlarged the amount of game, e.g. rabbits, pheasants and venison, in their meat sections. Factory farming is seen as cruel to the animals involved. Rabbit meat, in particular, is selling well as it is tastier than chicken and is cheaper than beef or pork. Game is also low in fat and cholesterol. If people are really concerned about animal welfare, they should take advantage of the increased availability of game in the supermarkets. They will also be getting a nutritious and cheap diet. So the key assumption here is that it's safer, that it's not being done by factory farming, so it's safer for the animals involved, it's better for their welfare. Let's have a look at the options. A, supermarkets want to improve their animal welfare image, that's not required to believe in this. B, the influence of celebrity chefs on shoppers cannot be underestimated, no, nope. and it says that quite clearly that we should be interested in this influence. C, no game meat is produced using factory farming methods, exactly. These factory farming methods are not being used for game meat. D, cheapness does not necessarily produce good value, no. Uh, e, supermarkets always respond to customer demands. Nope, not required. So the answer is C. Which one of the following would most strengthen the above argument? The production of standard disposable nappies from petrochemicals is wholly unsustainable. It is estimated that, while in disposable nappies, a baby will generate two tonnes of used nappies, which will end up in landfill, washable nappies have a significantly reduced environmental impact at production and at eventual disposal. Landfill sites are already in short supply, with the recycling programmes aiming to reduce waste. However, if the government wants to meet its sustainability targets, it must do more to increase the use of washable nappies. So to the extent that washable nappies are significantly contributing to environmental damage and landfill sites, there is a strong case for the government to introduce these um, to meet its sustainability targets. So let's have a look at the options. A, the washing process of nappies involves further energy consumption. No, that would suggest that actually uh, washable nappies have some negative effect. That means it's unclear which is preferable for the sustainable targets. 
B, some disposable nappies are made of natural polymers and are combustible. No, that would weaken it. That would suggest that some disposable nappies aren't proposing such an issue. C, most disposable nappies would take in excess of 500 years to biodegrade in landfill conditions. Yes, strong reason to support. They're going to cause a lot of trouble in the landfill site. D, several local authorities have incentive programmes to encourage parents to choose washable over disposable nappies. No, this would weaken it. That would suggest that work has already been done in this area by parts of the government. E, by 2014, all local authorities must, must offer doorstep recycling and many already offer composting bins and appliance collection. This would again suggest that the government's already doing a lot and maybe doesn't need to be doing this much more to achieve its sustainability targets. So the answer is C. Who arrives at Birgit first and by how much? To the nearest minute, if necessary. Sven is a keen cyclist and is riding from Alvaros to Birgit. At his normal cycling speed, this would take him 30 minutes. His wife Helga would go by car to bring him and his bike back. They leave at the same time that two thirds of the way between the two towns, the car breaks down and Helga has to walk the rest of the way. The car goes at three times the speed Sven cycles, but Helga walks at only one third of the speed he cycles. Okay, so it's going to take Sven 30 minutes, right? He's, doing, he's using his bike and that's how long it takes him to go from Alvaros to Berget. His wife Helga is going by car, they're leaving at the same time, but two thirds of the way, the car's breaking down. So they get two thirds, she gets two thirds of the distance, and this is by car, and the final third, she's walking. So how long is this going to take her? Well, we know when she's travelling by car, she's travelling at three times the speed that Sven cycles. And that means this distance would ordinarily take her ten minutes, a third of the time. And to travel two-thirds, it would take her six and two-third minutes. So it's going to take her 6.6 reoccurring minutes. She's got three and a third minutes left of her journey. But this three and a third minutes is taking her a third of the speed he would cycle. So this final third would take him ten minutes. But it's going to take her three times as much, so it's going to take her 30 minutes. So in total, she's taken 36 and two-thirds minutes, and he's taken 30 minutes. So he's going to arrive roughly seven minutes earlier, and that's C. Which one of the following combinations is not possible to produce by making one straight cut across a pentagonal piece of cloth? I'm making a patchwork quilt from leftover pieces of cloth of various shapes and sizes. This pentagonal piece of cloth is rather large, so I want to cut it into two pieces. Okay, so we're just looking at each of the options. Can we make it with just one cut across this cloth? So a triangle and a quadrilateral. Yes, very easy. It can be done like this. It's not A. B, a triangle and a pentagon. Hmm. I think this is possible, like that. So you've got triangle there, one, two, three. The pentagon here, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, B is possible. C, a triangle and a hexagon. Hmm. What about if we did this? So that's a triangle there. One, two, three, four, five. What about if we did this? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, we can do it. Okay, let's have a look at D, a quadrilateral, and a pentagon. I imagine this is going to be difficult now. But actually, no, we can do this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, that's possible. The answer must be E, but let's have a look. A quadrilateral and a hexagon. Yeah, that sounds pretty difficult. Because the only way you can make a quadrilateral is something like that. Maybe something like that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be a pentagon again. That's going to be very difficult. I think the answer is E. On what day should he choose to sit the test? Thomas needs to book a place to sit a test next week, but it's free only in the mornings. The test centre runs the test every day from Monday to Friday and holds a morning and an afternoon sitting. Each sitting has a total of 100 places available and will take place in the main hall unless there are 30 or fewer candidates, in which case a smaller room is used. He does not like to take tests in crowded places, so we want to make sure that he's in the main hall and will try to be with the smallest number of other candidates possible. The number of places that are still available are shown in the table below. So firstly, we can just ignore spaces available in the afternoon because he's not coming in the afternoon. He's only free in the mornings. And then we know that he wants to be in the main hall, so there has to be... Uh, more than 30 candidates. These are the spaces available, so we have to minus 100 from them. So the largest number is 75, there are 25 uh, spaces used up, but then there's a risk that he'll be in the smaller room, so we don't want Monday. Then the second largest is 63, so 63, there's 37, so we're going to be in the main hall and we'll have the smallest number of spaces being used up, so Friday is the best day, and the answer is E. Which one of the following, if true, most strengthens the above argument? In recent years, there's been a great deal 
of media attention focused on the private lives of politicians and world leaders, with particular attention paid to their personal relationships. There are those who suggest that this attention is unwarranted because only their professional abilities are important into their political role. This attitude fails to consider that the public have little insight into the day-to-day lives of world leaders, and indeed few points of reference. Personal lives offer common ground. In democratic states, leaders are elected based on how the public perceive them, and private lives can offer an insight into an individual's values. The personal aspects of a politician's life should continue to be reported if the electorate find it important. So the conclusion is clear, we should keep reporting uh, on these private lives of politicians to the extent the electorates find it important. Anything that gives us reason to think that's going to be important for the electorate to know in order for the electorate to make their decisions. A, all those in public eye are subjected to media attention. No, this isn't a reason necessarily why they should be. B, some politicians have high profile affairs. Hmm, I don't think this is uh, a good reason. I think well, that's not really adding anything to the passage. C, attention on their private lives can cause leaders to lose their focus. No, that would weaken the passage. That would suggest it's actually not in the interest because these leaders are perhaps performing less well with this attention. D, many of the public are very interested in the family lives of per- sports personalities. That's just irrelevant. E, most politicians claim to be respectful and honest in all aspects of their lives. Yes, this indicates that there's a strong reason that this will provide insight into their values because they're claiming to have these values in all aspects of their lives. So if those values are failing in one aspect of their lives, we might imagine they're failing in other aspects, the political aspects that the public has a right to care about. So the answer is E. Which one of the following most closely parallels the reasoning used in the above argument? Criminals often give themselves away by their lifestyle. My neighbour is a criminal because he bought and is living in a very expensive house, which I know he could not afford, as he is officially working only in a poorly paid job. So a general statement and an example of somebody behaving in a way that aligns with that general statement, and that means therefore they must fit the category with which that general statement applies. So let's have a look at these examples. A, the cat keeps bringing mice into the house. He never eats them, so I assume he hunts them either because that is his instinct or for pleasure. No, that's following a different structure. It's not saying uh, why he actually brings them into the house. B, it is impossible to write more than four pages in half an hour. You have just handed in seven pages of writing. You must therefore have spent longer than half an hour on it. No, this is far more logical than what we have in the passage. C, the bank was extremely well guarded in robbing. It would require very careful planning. The thieves who broke in yesterday must have spent months planning every detail of the crime. Again, too logical to follow what we have here, which is an illogical uh, set of statements. D, all my friends save money through the year and then go on holiday. I'm saving every month, so I think I should be able to go on holiday soon. I think this is the closest. It doesn't make sense. People who are in this category take this action. I'm taking this action, therefore I must be in this category. In the same way, people who are in this category take this action. My neighbour is uh, within this category because he is taking this action. So I think D is the closest. E, if the police want to identify criminals need to watch how they're spending their money, they do want to catch them, so they watch out for people buying cars or houses they can't legally afford. This is similar in content, but the structure is completely different. The reason is completely different. So the answer is D. Which one of the following best illustrates the principle underlying the argument above? There is often concern about the large quantities of money earned by top singers. It could be argued that there are many ways in which this money could be spent that would be beneficial to a large number of people. However, these people are receiving high earnings because they are the best at what they do, and those who are better than others at what they do should be rewarded. So the principle here is quite clear, and it states it very clearly, usually indicated with a because. Those who are better than others at what they do should be rewarded. So let's have a look if any of these uh, follow that same. A, to become a doctor requires as much longer course of study than other professions, therefore doctors should receive a higher rate of pay than members of those other professions. No, this is saying that it requires more effort, uh, and therefore they should be rewarded more, but this is about ability. If you said doctors uh, are much more capable than those of other professions, then they would deserve that higher pay. B, when making the decision about who should be accepted into the course, the bottom third of applicants, based on the results, were eliminated immediately. This is following something very similar, although it's focused on people who are being eliminated, so I'm not so sure it fits. C. Since efficiency is the most important aspect of the work, the end-of-year bonus was awarded to the member of staff who made the best use of time over the year. Yes, this is following exactly. It's about rewards as well. Those who are better than others should be rewarded accordingly. D. When deciding on the member of staff to be promoted, the director of the company looked to the records of the applicants and chose the one who had done the most overtime in the past year. No, most overtime does not mean the most capable. E, the prize for the best film was decided by taking the one that made the most money at the box office in its opening week. Not necessarily the best, that's just one measure of success. The answer is C. What is the minimum amount of tape he requires? Mr. Daly has bought some used carpenting for his new 24 meter by 12 meter car showroom. The carpet is an 8 meter by 4 meter rectangles which will be joined using a strip of double sided tape along all seams. Additionally, double sided tape will be needed to stick the carpet around the edges of the showroom. 
Okay, so let's imagine the showroom. We've got 24 by 12, 24 by 12, and you've got these eight by four rectangles. Now, because we're using the minimum amount of tape and it's related to the number of rectangles, we want to fit as few rectangles in as possible and fit them in with the least amount of tape required. So we know that eight is going to go three ways this way and we want the longer side going across the longer edge. And it's going to go like that, essentially, because it's going to go three, four is going to go three times into 12. So there's going to be nine pieces, essentially. Okay, uh, so we know there's going to be tape for all these connections and around the edge. Okay, so let's find out the edges first. So we've got an edge here and an edge here. 24 plus 24 is 48, plus 12 plus 12 is 24 again, taking us to a total of 72. Okay, and then we've got this here. That's going to be two more sets of 12, so that's another 24. And then we've got this here. That's going to be two more 24s, so another 48, it's another 72, so the total is 144, and the answer is C. How many times will the Winter Spectacular be performed at the Playtime Theatre during its run? So we see playing between Saturday 7th and Saturday 28th, performing nightly, Sunday to Friday, and it's closed 25th December, and you've got two showings on the Saturdays, and there's matinees also uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Okay, so what we need to know is the layout of the days. Um, so we know that we've got Saturday, the 7th, so Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we know 7th, 14th, 21st, 28th. Okay, we can play all of these dates until here. Okay, we've got 21 plus 1, we've got 22 dates in total being played. Minus the 25th where it's closed. Let's figure out which day the 25th is, that'll be helpful. Okay, so let's do it by day. So on the Saturdays, every Saturday we have a 5.30 and 8.30 uh, and a matinee. So we've got three performances every Saturday and we've got four Saturdays. So we've got 12 performances then. Every Sunday, how many performances do we have? Well, we have performances uh, the nightly on the Sunday and that's it. So we've got one, two, three performances across the Sundays. Let's put these in red. On the Mondays, how many performances do we have? Well, we just have one nightly performance, so one, two, three. On Tuesdays, again, three. On Wednesdays, well, Wednesdays usually we have the matinee and the nightly performance, we have two, but of course we're not open on the 25th, so we have just two, two days where we're performing on Wednesday, and each time we're playing twice, so there's going to be four performances. On the Thursday, we've got three Thursdays, and each Thursday we do two performances, one in the matinee and one in the evening, so there can be an additional six. And on the Friday, we have just one nightly performance, and we're performing on three Fridays. Okay, so the total number of performances, we just add all of these up. This is going to be nine, this is going to be 13. 12 plus nine is 21, plus 13 is 34. So the answer is B. Which one of the following does not give a result of 15? A popular option at the pizza parlour is the plus two pizza, which is a basic cheese and tomato pizza, plus a choice of any two different additional toppings from the following list. This gives 15 variations, which can be calculated as follows. Each of the six additional toppings can be combined with one of the five other to create 30 pairs, but this counts each pair twice, so we then divide it by two to give a result of 15. Okay, so let's have a look at the following options. A, the total number of matches when six teams play each other once. Hmm. Uh, total number of matches when 16 play each other once. That's good. But A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, A versus E, and A versus F. Then we've got B versus C, B versus D, B versus E, B versus F, C versus D, C versus E, C versus F, D versus E, D versus F, and then E versus F. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So it's not A. B, the total number of handshakes when six people shake hands with each other. That's exactly the same as six people uh, playing matches against one another. C, the total number of crackers needed for six children to pull a cracker with each of the others. Yeah, exact same as playing a match against one another. D, the total number of partnerships possible when two people are chosen from a short list of six to represent their society in the debate. That's exactly the same as imagining them playing matches against one another. 
E, the total number of cards sent when six friends send each other Christmas cards. No, this is different because when you send your friend a Christmas card, it's not the same when they send you a Christmas card. You don't divide it by G. So the answer is E. And to just show this, A to B, A to C, and then you start again, B to A, B to C, and so on. So the answer is E. Which of the following best expresses the main conclusion of the above argument? There is a naive view that the problem of rapid population growth can be effectively solved if enough money is invested in family planning services, but it's no accident that the world's highest population growth rates are in poverty-stricken sub-Saharan Africa. Child mortality in this region remains stubbornly high, so it makes sense for women to have lots of children to ensure that at least one son survives into their old age. Children are also economic necessities for peasant families engaged in traditional agriculture, and many systems, the larger the family, the more land is allocated to it. It follows that only by reducing the demand for large families through economic development can the problem of overpopulation be solved. So family planning will not be sufficient to deal with the problem of rapid population growth. This will also require economic development. It's pretty clear from the passage. It makes sense for women to have lots of children. This is sort of the key idea and the reasons for that are, firstly, child mortality is very high, so it makes sense to ensure at least one son survives. Secondly, economic necessities uh, for engaging in agriculture. And thirdly, the more child you have, the more land you might have. So look at the options. A, the need for economic development is greater than sub-Saharan Africa. Nope. It's saying if you want to deal with the problem of overpopulation, it may be the case that there's great need for economic development elsewhere for other reasons. B, the demand for large families is mainly caused by high child mortality. No, it states three reasons why it is so stubbornly high. It isn't clear which is the most important. C, the main consequence of a lack of economic development is overpopulation. It's not necessarily the main consequence, but it is a key one. D, overpopulation can be properly tackled only by economic development. Yes, exactly. E, to believe that family planning services can reduce population growth is to be naive. This is true, it is saying this, but it goes further. It does call for a certain co course of action, which is economic development. So the answer is D. Which of the following arguments has the same logical structure as the above argument? It is clear that telepathy is not possible, because if it were, people would be able to transfer their thoughts to each other for important purposes, for example, passing examination. But this does not happen. The only supposed demonstrations of telepathy are about trivial matters. Okay, so the structure is, uh, it is clear that A is not possible, because if it were possible, because if A were possible, it would be used for B. B doesn't happen. Uh, only non-B happen. So a bit of a strange structure, let's have a look. A, it is obvious that humans cannot travel through time. No one has ever done this except in novels and films, and we know that these are fiction. No, this isn't following the same structure. B, if humans were descended from apes, they would have some of the same patterns of behaviour. There are some patterns of behaviour common to human and apes, so humans are descended from apes. No, uh, it would be similar if it said there are no patterns of behaviour common to human apes, therefore humans are not descended from apes, but no, that's not what's happening here. C, if hypnotism could cure illnesses, we would not have to rely on drugs. But hypnotism cannot cure illness, so we do have to rely on drugs. No, if this were talking about you know, whether hypnotism exists successfully, then we might have more uh, weight for this answer. D, it is evident that human life is the most intelligent form of life on Earth, because humans can exploit other life forms for their own purposes, and this is exactly what the most intelligent life form would be able to do. So this is structured too strange, it's not in the right order, right? It would be if it were saying something like, it is evident that human life is the most intelligent form of life on Earth, because if it were, uh, this would happen, and if it were, you know, this does not happen, therefore human life is not the most important life on Earth, but that's not the structure. E, there is no evidence that intelligent life exists beyond our planet. If there were intelligent life, if there were a, also in the universe, we would have now had clear evidence of existence. Presumably we don't have clear evidence of existence. So there's no intelligent life other than that on Earth. There's one sentence really missing here, but it's following the closest of all of these to the logical structure in the paragraph. So the answer is E. Which one of the following is an underlying assumption of the argument above? For the second year running, the Silver Star Prize for Art was awarded to video artists, raising again the big question, what is great art? Many have condemned this year's choice on the grounds that a documentary-style video film cannot be considered as creative art at all in the same way that, say, painting and sculpture can. The Silver Star jury, however, praised the emotional force of the work and its complexity beneath an apparently simple surface. If they are right in this evaluation, then clearly video is as much a medium for great art as any other forms of expression. So the key assumption is that this is what art's about, right? It's about having emotional force and complexity beneath an apparently simple surface. If that's not what great art is about, then there's no contribution of this uh, praise towards believing that video is a form of great art. Let's have a look at the options. A. Any work with emotional force and complexity is capable of being great work. Exactly. B. The decision of the jury to award the prize for a video was the right one. It doesn't necessarily have to be the right choice. Uh, the reasoning, though, would suggest that 
this video is, is great art. That video can be great art. See, no one can really answer the question, what is great art? Uh, no, the author does claim to be able to answer that. G, this year's winning exhibit was deceptively simple. No, it doesn't have to be um, the case that they were right in their appraisal, that it had an apparently simple service. Um, it's just that art can have emotional force and complexity beneath an apparently simple service. That's what makes it great. And that applies equally to video film as it might to other mediums. E, painting and sculpture are the highest forms of creative art. It doesn't need to assume this. It actually comes to the conclusion that they're not necessarily the highest forms of creative art. If you drive 20,000 miles per year, how many acres of sugar beet will be needed to produce the ethanol you need? An acre of land planted with sugar beet produces 550 gallons of ethanol from the sugar by fermentation. A car converted to run on E75, a 75% ethanol, 25% petrol mixture, can do 40 miles per gallon. Okay, so let's find out how many gallons you need, and then we can find out... Uh, how many acres you would need by dividing uh, the number of gallons you need by the number of uh, gallons per acre. So you're going to have on the bottom this 550 because that's the number of uh, gallons per acre. But on top, what are you going to have? Well, on top, you're going to have uh, the number of gallons you need, and that's, div that's dividing the number of uh, miles you need by the number of gallons per mile. So the total number of miles you need are 20,000. And we want to divide that by 40 to get the number of gallons you need in E75, to get the number of gallons you need in ethanol, we then multiply that by 75%. So it's 20,000 divided by 40 times by 75 over 100, and then all of that divided by 550. The answer is B. Which one of these models would travel furthest on one full tank of petrol under optimum conditions? The following tables give information about five different car models. Okay, so one full tank of petrol, how many miles can it do? I think we ignore this column. I don't think the engine capacity is really that important to us. We want to find out how many miles. We want to modify these two numbers, and whichever comes to the highest is going to be the highest number of miles that can be travelled. Are there any obvious answers? Well, we know this is going to be 750. We know this is going to be 770. We know this is going to be 720. This is going to be 8640. And this is going to be 410. Yep, yeah, 820 divided by 2. And so the highest is definitely going to be this one, which is going to be gear. The yeah, answer so is B. Which one of the following conclusions can be drawn from the table above? The table below shows the percentage of adults grouped by age and socioeconomic group with no natural teeth. Okay, let's have a look at the options. A, most people have lost their natural teeth by the age of 55. Hmm, we don't actually know the relative size of each group. Um, but if we find that there's a majority in every single group um, that have lost their natural teeth by 55, then we can sort of prove this. Um, look at age 45. Age 55. Over here, we can see there's 14% only have lost their natural teeth. So it's not A. And professionals, employers, and managers, although we might expect they'd be a relatively small portion of the population, you know, it depends on the population, they could be a very high proportion of the overall population. The professional people tend to keep their natural teeth longer than semi skilled and unskilled manual workers. Okay, so comparing here these numbers, in every age category, is it the case that they have higher amounts of natural teeth being kept? Yes. In every age category, fewer people have lost their natural teeth than in uh, skilled manual and semi skilled and unskilled manual. So the answer is B. We can have a look at the other options anyway. C, manual work is bad for your teeth. Uh, no, there may be many reasons why uh, you might have been more likely to lose your teeth if you're from a semi-skilled and unskilled manual background. Uh, it may not actually be to do with the work itself. It might be to do with other correlated factors. D, people without natural teeth tend not to be employed as manual managers. No, that's supposing uh, a causal link there that we can't draw. Either over three times as many 45 to 50 year old manual workers with no teeth as professionals. No, uh, we can talk about proportions here. We can't talk about absolute numbers because we don't know what the proportions are um, of these groups of the overall population. So the only answer we have is B. Which one of the following presents the strongest challenge to the argument above? Organic food is no healthier than other produce, scientists claim. This was the headline in an article published in 2009 in The Independent. It reported that a comprehensive review of 50 years of evidence showed no appreciable difference in nutrient levels between organic and conventional farm produce. 
If the review is correct, shoppers will think twice about buying organic food, especially if the price differences remain significant. Only if people really do receive some health benefit in return for the extra money will the current upward trend in organic sales continue. No, there's some key assumptions here. Firstly, that you're purchasing this food because of health benefits, when it may be for other reasons, maybe environmental reasons. And secondly, that people are actually going to follow uh, the reality. You know, people might perceive there to be a health benefit even when there isn't one and continue to purchase these goods because of a perceived health benefit. So let's have a look at the options. A, shoppers who read The Independent are more likely to buy organic produce than readers of other newspapers. No, that's not necessary. to chat. That doesn't, I'm not sure that even challenges the argument. B, most shoppers take more notice of price than they do of nutritional benefits from choosing to buy. No, that would strengthen the argument. See if the review is correct. Shoppers will have received no health benefit in the past 50 years, yet organic sales have continued to rise. Yes, this would indicate that uh, what they're claiming is nothing new, and there's no reason to expect that behaviour will change as a result of it. It's not saying behaviour will change as a result of the review. It's saying behaviour will change as a result of uh, the health benefits. And these haven't changed. D, if organic food had more nutritional value than conventional farm produce, scientists would have found out long before now. No, that's not a challenge. If there's no appreciable difference in nutrient levels, then there's no advantage of shoppers to switching back to conventional produce. No, there's an advantage in price. So the answer is C. Which of the following identifies the flaw in the above argument? There is a widespread dissatisfaction and disillusionment in Britain with politics and with politicians, who are seen as untrustworthy. Many of the electorate do not even bother to vote in the general election. In Switzerland, democracy is no more direct is more direct than in Britain, in the sense that many referendums take place and many important political decisions are thus based directly on the votes of citizens rather than those of their elected representatives. Surveys show that in those parts of citizens where the important decisions are made by referendum, the citizens are happier than those in areas where there's less opportunity to influence decisions. So if we were to adopt the Swiss system in Britain, the dissatisfied and disillusioned British electorate would be much happier. But there's a few key flaws here. Firstly, that this is, you know, this correlation means causation, that because uh, they have these referendums, the Swiss are happier in these areas. And secondly, that what applies in Switzerland might apply equally here, amongst potentially other flaws. But let's have a look at the options. A, it assumes that most Swiss citizens vote in general elections. No, it doesn't. B, it assumes that there's only one reason why some Swiss citizens are happier. Yes, it's assuming that the reason these Swiss citizens are happier is because of the referendums. And it may be because of an enormous number of other things. It might be culture, it might be their workplace, maybe the decisions that are being made generally by politicians are better in their interests and so on. C, it assumes that British citizens would trust politicians if there were more referendums. It doesn't necessarily assume that. Um, you'd imagine that one reason they might be happy is because they're bypassing the politicians. D, it assumes that there is only one reason why the British are disillusioned with politics. There doesn't have to be one reason, but there can be one fix. E, it assumes that better policies emerge when important decisions are made by referendum. It's not necessarily saying that people are happier because better decisions are being made. It may be just that those decisions align more with their preferences or that they get to have the opportunity to be part of those decisions, which they enjoy. So the answer is B. Which of the following best expresses the main conclusion of the argument above? Sound economics may underline the government's plans to put more prisons under private control, but the privatisation of prisons is nonetheless wrong. Although some countries observe basic human rights, they have the power to take away the liberty of individuals who break certain laws. This power is so far-reaching that only the state itself, acting through its offices, should be trusted with it. Many prisoners have disturbed backgrounds and a contempt for authority, so exceptional disciplinary measures are needed to maintain order. The power to enforce such measures should not be left to private profit-making organisations. So it's wrong to privatise prisons. We should not privatise prisons. And the reasons it gives for this are that this power of taking away individuals' liberty is so far-reaching that only the state should be trusted with it. Uh, two, that exceptional disciplinary measures may be needed, which we maybe we don't want the private uh, organisations to be making. So let's have a look at the options. A, the state of far-reaching powers and duties. No, that's a reason to support the conclusion. B, the privatisation of prisons is wrong. Yes, we shouldn't do it. C. Order in prisons often requires special disciplinary measures. No, that's a reason to support the main conclusion. D. Prison inmates often have disturbed backgrounds and contempt for authority. No, again, a reason to support. And E. Special disciplinary measures should not be entrusted to private organisations. Again, a reason to support the main conclusion that privatisation of prisons is wrong. And that's the answer. What is the minimum number of days from now until I can bring my average back up to five miles per day? Last month, in an attempt to prove my fitness, I began to run daily. The maximum distance I have time to fit in on a particular day is 8 miles, but my aim is to maintain an average of at least 5 miles per day. After 15 days, my average was just under 6 miles per day, then the following day I increased my average to just over 6. Since then, for the last 9 days, up to and including today, I have been able to run only 2 miles each day. What is the minimum number of days from now until I can bring my average back up to 5 miles per day? So we need to figure out what the total is now, and then we can figure out how much we need to... Uh, how many days we need to run the maximum number of miles in order to get it up to five miles per day as an average. 
So how many miles did we currently run? Well, after 15 days, my average was just under six miles per day. So it was roughly 15 times six. It was roughly 90 miles having been run in total, just over 90 miles after an additional day. Since then, for the last nine days, so after 16 days, it was roughly 90 miles. It was roughly, sorry, 16 times six was roughly 96 miles, a little bit over 96 miles. Since then, for the last nine days, up to and including today, I've been able to run only two miles each day. So 18 miles more, nine times uh, two. So the total number of miles having been run is about 114. And that was across 16 plus nine days, across 25 days. Okay, uh, the current average is about 114 to 25, so it's pretty low. It's about just under 5. Um, it's about 4 and 14 over 25. What we want, maybe we can do this in algebra, we want 114 plus 8x, because we're running the maximum number of miles, over 25 plus x has got to be equal to 5. Right, because 25 days plus x more days, each day we run 8 miles. So let's rearrange this now. That's 114 plus 8x equals 5, 25 plus x. 114 plus 8x equals 125 plus 5x. 3x equals 11. 2x equals 11 over 3. It's taking me at least 4 more days, just over 3 and a third. So it's going to take me at least four days to get there. So the answer is B. What is the maximum number of times that my automaton can possibly have been activated during one hour? I have a bird automaton that when activated flaps its wings and whistles three different tunes successfully, selected at random from its repertoire of 10. It performs one of its 10 tunes for 10 seconds, six of them for 15, and three of them for 20 seconds each. When my granddaughter visits, she is fascinated at activating it again and again as soon as it stops each time. On her last visit, she kept it going for a whole hour, no loss count of how many times she activated it. Okay, what is the maximum number of times that it could have possibly been activated? In order to be activated the maximum number of times, it needs to do the shortest possible uh, tunes, set of tunes each time. What is the shortest possible set of three tunes that can be sung successively? Um, well, you take the shortest one of 10 seconds, and then the two next two shortest, which are 15 seconds, the 10 plus 15 plus 15 is 40. So that's each set is 40 seconds. And she activates it again and again for a whole hour. Okay, so it's one hour. How many times can it be activated during that? There's no breaks between these sets. So 60 minutes divided by 40 seconds. So 60 minutes over two thirds of a minute. So 60 times by 3 over 2, 130 equals 90 times. The answer is C. Which one of the following could be the opening hours of the shop for Tuesday and Friday? Graham recorded the number of visitors to his shop each day last week and presented the results in the bar shop below. When he calculated the number of customers per hour, he found that he had the same number for five of the days, but the values for Tuesday and Friday were slightly higher. The opening hours of the shop are as follows. Okay, and we need to figure out the opening hours for Tuesday and Friday. So, on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday, the number of customers per hour were exactly the same. Let's find out the total number of customers. I think this is X, 2, 3, 4, this is 4X. Uh, here we've got, sort of, well, let's just, for simplicity, let's give X a number. So let's say this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So here we've got 40 customers. On Wednesday we've got roughly 48 customers. Thursday, 40 customers. 40. This is 30. About 40. And this is about 24 customers. Okay. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday. Same number of customers per hour. So how many hours are there on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday? It's open for 6 plus 4. 10 hours, 12 hours, 10 hours, 10 hours, and 2 plus 4, 6 hours. Okay. 
how many customers per hour on Monday? 40 customers across 10 hours, about four. Wednesday, we've got 48 customers divided by 12 hours, four. Thursday, 40 customers divided by 10 hours, four. Four. 24 divided by six, yeah, four. Okay. So on Tuesday and on Friday, the number of customers per hour are slightly higher. Okay. So that means there has to be more than four customers per hour. So 30 divided by x has to be greater than four. So let's rearrange this. 30 is greater than four x. X has to be greater than 30 over four. X has to be less than 30 over four, where x is the number of hours. And 30 divided by four is gonna be seven and a half. So the store has to be open for less than seven and a half hours on Tuesday. Let's have a look at the options. Okay, here it's open for eight hours, so it can't be this one. Here it's open for three, plus this open for seven and a half hours. It has to be open slightly less than that, but maybe that's acceptable. Uh, this is probably acceptable. Here it's open for seven hours. So it's open for eight hours, so that's not acceptable. And here it's open for seven hours. So I think if we want it to be open for slightly less than seven and a half hours, then I think E is the, the way to go. Because otherwise it has the same number of customers per hour as the others, right? If you had 30 customers over seven and a half hours, that is actually going to be equal to four. So it can't be B or C. The answer has to be E. That's the answer is E. Which of the following is true would most weaken the above argument? Compare and contrast the initial responses of two major world powers to the Haitian earthquake disaster. Within hours, the USA had sent in hospital and assault ships and an aircraft car with 19 helicopters, the 82nd Airborne Division with 3,500 troops and hundreds of medical personnel. It put the country's small airport back on an operational footing. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, the European Union geared itself up with a Brussels press conference led by its high representative. A small group of bored-looking journalists in the Commission's lavishly appointed press room heard her stumbling through a prepared statement in which she said that she had conveyed her condolences to the UN Secretary General and pledged 3 million euros in aid. The USA's willingness to act proved that it is the only genuine superpower. So, there's a couple of things that would weaken this. Firstly, thinking about other major world powers than the USA and the EU. And secondly, thinking about other reasons why the USA may have been better prepared to act in this case uh, than the EU. Uh, but that maybe this case doesn't generally apply as an indication of its willingness to act. So let's have a look at the options. A, Haiti is much closer to the USA than to the European Union. No, because just because it's closer does not mean that it's, it doesn't mean it's more willing to act. You might think the European Union is still close enough to send some support. Uh, this is really demonstrating that it wasn't willing to, to take action properly. Not that it wasn't able to. B, the European Union has as many men as armed forces as the USA. No, we're using the measure of willingness to act here to decide what's a genuine superpower. C, of the countries of the EU, only, gen only Great Britain and France possess naval and airborne capacity for major overseas operations. No, this actually strengthens the argument. It undermines the case of the EU even having the capacity to act, let alone the willingness. D, the countries of the EU respond to this and all humanitarian crises individually because their armed forces are allied but not integrated. Yes, this would indicate that this is not a good example of the general willingness to act of the EU, because in the case of humanitarian crises, it doesn't respond as a superpower as a whole, it responds as, as a collection of individual nations. E, the response of the USA to the crisis was criticised by France as having a hidden agenda of wanting to increase its influence in Haiti. No, I'd imagine a big part of what superpower is, is a power that wants to increase its influence across the world. Um, having a hidden agenda, at least by the metrics of this paragraph, does not make you any less of a genuine superpower. Which of the following is an underlying assumption of the above argument? One of the most catastrophic scenarios that could hit this planet would be a world without fish. Surely this is a matter for UN to act on and swiftly. Areas of ocean should be set aside as no-go zones for trawlers of any nationality to enable our dwindling fish shops to have somewhere to reproduce with impunity. We're told that farmed fish is just as good, but this is futile if the wild fish that are fed to the farmed fish disappear. This crisis should be moved right to the top of the global agenda. A. At present, fish cannot reproduce safely in the wild. Uh, no, that's not an underlying assumption. There's reason to believe that. The fish stocks are dwindling. Uh, B, there's not enough publicity about the fishing crisis. No, it's not about publicity, it's about action. C, farm fish not taste as good as wild fish, irrelevant. D, fish farming is impossible without wild fish as food. Yes, this is an issue because the wild fish are diminishing and the idea is that we're not going to manage with the farmed fish because we need the wild fish to feed the farmed fish. But maybe we can actually feed the farmed fish without the wild fish and um, everything keep going without any need for wild fish at all. E, foreign trawlers are responsible for dwindling fish stocks. No, it's saying that you know, we want to stop trawlers of any nationality. It may be domestic trawlers that are causing the issue. So the answer is D. 
Which of the following, if true, would most strengthen the above argument? Many rich countries protect their farming sectors with generous subsidies. It may be claimed that this policy can benefit countries in which people are starving or malnourished by encouraging farmers to produce more food than can be consumed in their own countries. But the policy is not in the best interests of poorer countries. Poor countries do not want charitable handouts. They want to develop the ability to feed their populations by their own efforts. If the amount spent on the European Commission's common agricultural policy were invested in, say, irrigation schemes, that would transform the agriculture of many impoverished nations. This would surely be a better way to solve the problem of world hunger. So anything that indicates that actually this money isn't being well spent uh, and that subsidies are harming the people of these countries would support the idea that they are contributing to the problem of world hunger and there's better ways to solve it. Let's look at the options. A, malnutrition is less likely to occur in countries with slow population growth. This seems really irrelevant. B, wars and natural disasters such as floods are major causes of malnutrition. I know that would weaken the argument. That would suggest that actually it's not about this issue of irrigation. C, much of the excess food produced by rich countries rots before it can be exported. Yes, this looks really promising. Much of the excess food produced by rich countries rots before it can be exported. This would indicate that you know, a better solution to world hunger wouldn't be just exporting all this food that's being produced within rich countries, because if we tried to do that, a lot of it would rot. So the answer is C. D, without subsidies to farmers in rich countries, the countryside would deteriorate. So what? This is uh, not going to strengthen the argument, it would actually weaken it. You know, rich countries then would be concerned about their countryside deteriorating and perhaps negative impacts on that. E, agriculture in poor countries is less mechanised than in rich countries. Uh, that would actually weaken the argument. It would suggest that even if you invest in irrigation systems, there'll be further issues that mean that maybe it's less efficient in producing agriculture in those uh, poor countries. So the answer is C. If each application of fertiliser costs £1,000, how many applications should be made to maximise the farmer's profits? The graph below shows the additional financial value of repeated applications of fertiliser applied to crops in a field for a year. For example, two applications gives £2,000 more value to the crop than one application. Okay, so essentially you're going to stop doing it when the added value is less than the additional cost. And each one costs 1000 So for here, the added value is 500 costs 1000 so worthwhile doing. Two, added value is 2000 costs 2000 makes sense. Oh, per application, so total value is 2500 over two, uh, over two applications, which costs a thousand, so you've got five hundred pounds in added value. Makes sense to do two. Three, the additional cost is a thousand. The additional added value is one thousand five hundred. Additional cost is a thousand. Makes sense. For four, five, and six, the additional uh, value add is less than the additional cost of a thousand. So it doesn't make sense. It only makes sense to do three applications. So the answer is C. How many minutes late was yesterday's ten twenty a.m. train from Taylorville when it arrived at Erd? There was a half-hourly train that operates along the Robrina Valley between Erd and Terreville. Leaving Erd at 10 and 40 minutes past each hour, the train stops at Erigen, Lowley, Erigen, Ubley and Gideon before arriving at Terreville 51 minutes after departure from Erd. In the opposite direction, trains leave Terreville at 20 and 50 minutes past each hour, arriving at Erd 51 minutes later. The trains normally average a speed of 60 kilometres, but this rises to 80 kilometres if they're running late. They stop for three minutes at each station en route, but this is reduced to two minutes when running late. Yesterday, the 10.20 a.m. train from Taylorville arrived at Ublay on time, but because of a technical fault, remained at Ublay for 22 minutes. There were no further delays. How many minutes late was yesterday's 10.20 a.m. train from Taylorville when it arrived at Erd? Okay, there's a lot there. Let's take it step by step. Yeah, let's figure out what time it should have arrived. Let's find the time it actually arrived, and then let's find out the delay. So the time it should have arrived, well, we've got a distance of Taylorville to Erd of 36 uh, kilometers, 60 kilometers per hour, Usually should take 36 minutes, plus the two minutes per stop. Well, we're not going to include Erd there, but we've got Aragon, Ali, Ergon, Ublay, and Gideon. So five stops, each is three minutes. So an additional 15 minutes for the stops takes us to 51 minutes it should have taken. Let's see how long it actually took. So we know it did 12 kilometers. Ublay took 12 minutes to get here. Plus it had already done a stop at two minutes, at three minutes at Gideon. So it's 15 minutes into the journey when it gets stopped at Hublet. Then it remains there for 22 minutes, so now it's 37 minutes into the journey. Okay, now it's traveling uh, from Hublet to Erd, which is 24 kilometers. Okay, 24 kilometers at 80 kilometers per hour, so distance, time. The time is distance over speed. It's 24 kilometers divided by 80 kilometers per hour, and we want it in minutes, so then times that by 60. There's three, four, one, six, so it takes us 18 minutes, plus the stops along the way. But let's just do this first. So the 18 minutes takes us to 55 minutes. Okay, so it's already four minutes late. Plus the stops along the way, we had to stop here, here, here. 
and each of those stops took two minutes. So that's three times two is six minutes. So it's an additional six minutes late. We were already four minutes late plus an additional six minutes, so now it's 10 minutes late. The answer is C. Which one of the following gives a possible view of the church? The diagram below shows a view of the church from above. There are three windows facing south, two windows facing north, a stained glass window facing east. The only doors at one in the westernmost and one in the north facing wall. Okay, so let's just put some things here. Okay, there's three windows facing south. Uh, we don't know where they are, but there's three windows here. Two windows facing north, two windows here. Stained glass window facing east, stained glass. The only doors are one in the westernmost, the door, and one on the north facing wall. So there's a door here. Okay, let's have a look. So the view from the east, okay, there just has to be a stained glass. Ah, there should be no door, so it can't be A. B, view from the west, okay, we should see a door though, where's the door? So it can't be B. C, view from the south, okay. There should be three windows. Where are the three windows? No. D, view from the south, there's three windows. This looks like it could be possible. Okay, let's have a look at E. View from the north. There should be two windows and a door. There are two windows and a door. Hmm, so E also looks possible. Ah, so the reason this can't be a view from the south is because if you're looking from the south, this should be on the right hand side and it's coming on the left. So the answer is E. Got two windows and a door, and everything is the right way around. Which one of the following best expresses the main conclusion of the argument? The criminal law, armed only with punishment, is only ever capable of controlling a tiny minority of criminals. Communities can exert control over the behaviour of most people in a much more positive way, through the disapproval of one's neighbours and fellow citizens, and through a whole host of accepted social attitudes. Mass unemployment creates a large class of people who reject those attitudes and who are prepared to encourage or at least tolerate illegal ways of making a living, and hence has a profoundly subversive effect on society. So the main conclusion seems to be that mass unemployment uh, has a profoundly subversive effect on society because it means that the community control mechanisms are less uh, strong. Let's have a look at the options. A, large-scale unemployment subverts society. Yes. B, the criminal law controls behaviour of any time minority. No, it's using that to set up what it wants to say later. C, large-scale unemployment makes crime more acceptable. Yes, it's saying this, but it's saying that it makes it more acceptable um, which means that society is profoundly subverted. It wants to say something bolder than that. D, controlling antisocial behaviour is best done by the community. It's not saying that it's best done by the community, but it's an important mechanism of combating it. E, mass unemployment causes a rejection of accepted social attitudes. Yes, it's saying that, uh, but that is moving us towards this sort of profound conclusion that it profoundly subverts society. So the answer is A. Which one of the following most closely parallels the reasoning used in the above argument? Our football team always loses the match if it's raining. They won last Saturday, so it can't have been raining. A always happens if B, uh, the opposite of A happened, or A did not happen. Therefore, it cannot have been B. B cannot have happened. Let's look at the options. A, if you work part-time, you earn less than people who work full-time. I work full-time, therefore I earn more than people who work part-time. No, it should go like this. Uh, if you work part-time, you earn less than people who work full-time. I earn more than people who work full-time, therefore I work part-time or even in this case, actually, it should be, I don't earn, and then I don't, da, da, da. But anyway, B, my aunt is always happy if she's bought a new hat. She was happy today, so she must have bought a new hat. No, we're talking about negatives here. C, John always stays at home if there's snooker on TV. There was snooker on TV tonight, so John will sit at home. No, nope, we're talking about negatives. D, David always enjoys films if they have a big star in them. David didn't enjoy that film, so it kind of had a big star in it. Yes, exactly. A, if B, it always happens if B. A didn't happen, therefore B could not have happened. E, my cat has gone missing because I forgot to feed her. My cat always goes missing if I forget to feed her. There's no negatives there. The answer is D. Which one of the following illustrates the principle used in the above argument? When you have finished your meal at a restaurant and you get the bill, there's often a note at the bottom pointing out that the service charge is not included. This can easily lead to one of two reactions, leaving a tip because you feel it is what expected, or not leaving a tip out of annoyance at the unsubtle request for more money. Neither of these is an appropriate response. The tip is a reward for providing good service. We should be rewarding those waiters who perform well and not just issuing tips as a matter of course. The principle here is that you should reward those who perform well. You can see that because it includes the should statement. It's indicating that it's going to give you a principle. And that principle applies broadly, not just to this situation. Let's look at the options. A, the company has made record profits this year, so all the employees will be getting a bonus when they next receive their pay. No, it should be based on those employees who perform the best. B, when redundancies needed to be decided, Fred was laid off as his work being particularly poor for the last few weeks. So this is more about punishment than reward, but it's aligning with the meritocratic element. 
C, Tim got B grades in his exams rather than C grades and he was predicted so his parents bought him the bicycle that he'd been asking for. This looks like following lines, you're being rewarded for good performance, although uh, it's more about expectations here, so I don't know the extent to which it follows, but I think C is probably going to be the answer. D, the syndicate won the lottery last week and split the money equally between all the members. No, not at all the same principle. E, as companies perform well, the value on the stock exchange will increase. It's not clear that a value on the stock exchange increasing is a kind of reward for a company, so I don't think that applies as strongly. I think C is going to be the answer. When travelling in Kwamistan and not understanding the currency, I offered a red note for an item marked 135k. I was given in change three green coins and one blue coin. Later, for a newspaper marked 33k, I ordered a handful of coins and the vendor took four green and one blue. There are only these three donations of money available. The smallest is marked 1k and each higher denomination is a whole number multiple of the lower denominations. How many green coins are worth one red? So let's write it out algebraically. 1 through 5 is equal to red minus 3 green minus 1 blue because that's what you offered in change. And then 33 is equal to 4 green and blue. Now to avoid lots of algebraic difficulties, what we're going to do is take the last line, which is really key, and note that the smallest is marked as 1k. And so let's say that we, we know first of all the red is not the smallest because we were able to break it down into change. And so it's either going to be the green or the blue. Let's say first that the blue is the 1. Okay, so imagining the blue is the 1. Uh, this is written as 1 through 5 equals 1 plus minus 3j minus 1. We can rewrite this as 1 through 6 equal to r minus 3j. Okay, and take the other one. 33 is equal to 4g plus 1, uh, which makes 32 is equal to 4g. g is equal to 8. And if g is equal to 8, 1 through 6 equals r minus 24. r is equal to 160. Yeah, this tracks really nicely because they're all multiples of one another. 160 is a multiple of 8 and a multiple of 1. 8 is a multiple of 1. So this would work perfectly. And in this case, how many green coins are worth one red note? Uh, so 160 divided by 8 is going to be 20, so the answer is B. Now, just for completeness, I'm now going to check the other route, which is what if G were equal to 1? In the case where G is equal to 1, we have that this is equal to 3, and that this is equal to 4. So that takes us to 29, is it B is equal to 29. Okay, fine. And then this is going to be rewritten as 138 is equal to r minus 29. So r is equal to 167. Well, 167 is not divisible by 29, so this is not going to be a multiple of uh, one another. This is not going to work. So we stick with what we had before, where b is the answer. What is the minimum number of committee members who must change the way they voted if the results to be reversed at the next meeting? At committee meetings of the Massing Social Club, motions are carried or defeated by a simple majority, abstentions being ignored. At the last meeting, a proposal to install a satellite dish was defeated by 8 votes to 5, with 10 committee members abstaining. However, because of the large number of abstentions, it was decided the matter should be discussed further at the next meeting and a vote taken again. What is the minimum number of committee members who must change the way they voted in order for the result to be reversed, i.e. in order for the proposal to be voted in favour? So in order to get a favourable outcome, let's have a look at each of the options. Let's say only two people change their mind. Well, let's say we have two people move from abstention to vote four, uh, then it would be eight versus seven, so that would not work. Okay, well, let's say two people move from against to four, uh, then it would be six against versus seven in favour, so that would work. So you'd only need two people to change their mind. And that would be the answer. If Andrew knows the number of the houses opposite Amy Eats, which one of the following statements is definitely true? The housing estate in which Andrew lives has streets of variable length. In each street, the houses are directly opposite each other with the same number of houses on each side. However, the numbering of the houses is inconsistent. Some streets are numbered consecutively on each side, starting at one end of the street, going up to the end, and then back down to the other side. Other streets have the odd numbers on one side, starting from one, and the evens on the other side, starting with two at the same end. Andrew's friend Amy lives on the same state as 25 Asatia Avenue, which is not the end house on the street. If Andrew knows the number of houses opposite Amy, which one of the following statements is definitely true? Okay, so you've got a street, and there's two ways they can be numbered. Uh, so Amy lives in 25, and it's not on the end of the street, so you've got at least one house here. Um, let's say we know the number of the house here. What do we know? Okay, let's have a look at the options. A, he knows the exact number of houses in the street. Well, no, because if we're doing the uh, odd numbers, then it could be the case that yeah, this is just 24, so they could, this street could go on indefinitely, so no. B, he knows that the number of houses in the street is one of two numbers. No, it could be indefinite. C, if the house opposite Amy's is 26, he knows the number of houses in the street. No, in that case, he really doesn't know the number of houses on the street. 
Um, the only way he could know is if it was sort of going around like this, but it's not because it's not the nth house on the street. D, if he knows the number of the house next door to Amy, he can work out the number of houses in the street. No, because let's say doing the opposite side, so 24, 25, let's, this would just be 27. It could still go on indefinitely. E, he knows the number of the houses immediately adjoining Amy's. Yes. Once you know the rule, you can figure out all the houses' numbers. So the answer is E.